and make sure I get the screen share so we can all be on the same page here. I have lecture six open. So that's where we're, we're starting for today. Um, so the things that I just said so that the video or the, the audio captures it on YouTube, uh, your next, your last, I should say, formative assessment is available in ICON, and that will be due Monday night, as usual. I will look them over on Tuesday, and we'll go over it in class. And your very last homework is available. It is a path model. And this one, the most of the effort will be in specifying the path model. There's one. There's literally just one model in the whole homework. And there's no result, typical results section. Instead, I'm asking questions about path models that are available in your lecture notes and or um, examples. So it's a little bit different, should not be um, a huge undertaking. I have checked it in Stata's SEM package in M plus and in Levon. And the answers all converge with the exception of one or two numbers that might be off in the third decimal place. So Stata seems to be the oddball out with respect to M plus and Levon on this one. So I have a note in the instructions for the homework that if you're trying an answer and you're sure it's right, but it's not taking it, go up 0.001, go down 0.001. And that may be enough to trick the system into taking it. Otherwise, let me know if you need um, troubleshooting help. Okay, so this is, we're, we're winding down, folks. Just three days of class left. Can you imagine? I know. It's, it's both too fast and too slow at the same time, somehow. But... Uh, Maybe if it weren't 45 freaking degrees outside, it would feel more like the end of the semester. But nope, this is what we're, we're stuck with for right now. Such is life. And we are also talking about path models. So tell me what you remember from last time. Here's a picture to cue your memory. I'll take words, gestures, letters, anything. What do you remember? They don't, they don't always, always mean that, that what you're modeling, modeling is causal. Yeah. Statistical models do not provide causal inference. Research designs provide causal inference. So people call uh, structural equation models or path models causal models. They are not. They are absolutely not. Math don't care. That is correct. That's, that's, a, that's a very useful phrase. Math don't care. The context of that was in this slide right here, trying to decide which of these models is more correct, X predicting Y predicting Y, or the other way around, and math don't care. They will fit the same, because they both specify the same possible relationships directly between two variables and indirectly between the other, the set of the third. Um, I have a really quick yeah. question. Sure. Um, so, when it comes to doing this in R, and this, and this is kind of in relation to the horrible thing I know we've gone to quite yet, but does the SCM function or the Levon function yield different results with path models? There's an SEM function? There is. Okay, I don't know that one. The Levon one did more SEM did work, and I got the right log likely did, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> Are you already doing the homework that I just posted like 10 minutes ago? I just want to be done this semester. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I just want to be done with this class. And I'd be like, same, dude. No, this, this class brings life, life into me at times where uh, I thought I was dying. That's very good at saying it, but yeah. No, I don't, I don't mean that in the way that it sounded, and I'm sure you, you don't either. But um, I don't know about the SEM one. Um, so I, if you got the, wrong, the right log likelihood, chances are good that everything else will be okay because I didn't ask for any standard errors or p-values. Those are the things that tend to differ a little bit across algorithms. My guess is that the coefficients should work. The only way that I know how to do this stuff in R is in Levon. So that's what I have demonstrated, but you can use whichever you like. Uh, how about drawing conventions? What does it mean if something's in a box? It's observed, yes. It is a column in your data set if it's a box. And the way that these models are structured is one row per person. So all your separate predictors, all your separate outcomes would be in separate columns in this type of wide data set. 
So if you had, say, an outcome in condition A, an outcome in condition B, and an outcome in condition C, that's three columns. That's not one column like it was before. So we're back to this where every box means a column. And what about things in circles or ovals? What was the word? Lat latent. Latent or unobserved, yes. So latent variables uh, in structural equation models, that's the difference between SEM, by the way, and path models is whether you're including latent variables. It's SEM if you have latent variables. It's path models otherwise. Uh, the error terms for these boxes are sometimes depicted in circles and sometimes left off depending on how complicated the diagram gets. And yes, Farhan, latent variables are not real. We believe they're real, but we can't directly measure them. We can only measure them through real things, which means we're never quite sure if we're right. Uh, how about arrows? If I have an arrow that's going from a box to another box, which box is the predictor? The from box. Yeah, so like in this picture right here, X1 is predicting Y1 because the arrow goes this way. In the, the, the box set below it, it's the opposite. And this Y1 is the predictor and X1 is the outcome. And what does it mean if the arrow has two heads to it, like over here? Yeah, that's a covariance. So it's a covariance in the unstandardized solution or a correlation in the standardized solution. Yep. Good. Um, when would you do a path model? When is this useful? Oh, no, no questions. Multivariate, yes. So when you're trying to predict multiple outcomes at the same time, that would be one reason. Uh, when variables are both predictors or outcomes or multiple outcomes, yes. So for instance, Y1 in this diagram right here is serving two purposes. It is both an outcome with respect to X1, but it is also a predictor with respect to Y2. That's the type of model that is very tricky to specify by tricking univariate software and sometimes impossible depending on the combination that you want to do. So um, in that situation, people are often interested in mediation, which is the idea of indirect effects through intermediate variables. So mediation is best done in a multivariate setting. Um, in generalized models, you have more flexibility with what you can do for each individual outcome if you put it in a path model, but less flexibility than if you fit a univariate analysis just with one outcome, because there's fewer options in most software packages for what your links and distributions can be. So it's, it's sort of a mixed bag. It's more flexible in some respects, but less flexible than a univariate setting. Um, yeah, I think those are the highlights. Can you think of anything I'm forgetting? Anything you want to review before we dive back in? Lisa, can you yes. explain again? Can, can you explain again the slide 15? Slide 15? Yes. 13. 13. Yes. Maybe. This one, yeah. Degrees of Freedom? Exactly. Yes, yes I can. So let's just start there, shall we? Why not? So the idea of model, model identification in path models is whether or not what you've requested is actually estimable. It's a lot easier to figure out if your model is identified than when you have latent variables also included because latent variables have to be given a scale for the model to be identified since they're latent and not observed. But since everything is observed, everything has a scale. So the question then is whether or not our model has spent all possible degrees of freedom with respect to recreating the relationships that are present in the observed data. And so the notion of degrees of freedom has to do with how many possible more parameters you could add that aren't already included. So total degrees of freedom is a function of the number of summary elements for a set of variables. So the number of elements in a covariance matrix, so number of variances, number of covariances, 
as well as the number of means. That is the information that's going into the analysis, essentially. Even if you're working with full information where you've got the raw data, that's what the model's trying to recreate, is a summary of it. And so that's where this formula for total degrees of freedom comes in. Based on the number of variables in your likelihood, you can calculate what the total number of possible paths would be, and that's the number of things that you can estimate. Then how many you actually estimated then gives you um, the basis for computing what's known as the model degrees of freedom, which is the difference. So data input minus output. Okay, does that help, Vladimir? Yes. yes. Yes, okay. So this can be confusing if you're used to thinking about degrees of freedom as either number of slopes or related to number of people because it's neither. It's the number of parameters that you can put in an analysis. And so you have a total that's based on how many variables you have. The question is how many did you spend? And so then we get into vocabulary to describe if you spent them all or not. But just in terms of what you really need to pay attention to practically speaking. One of the things that goes in, in terms of degrees of freedom, is the mean of each variable. As long as each variable has a separately estimated intercept, those intercepts will help recreate the observed means. So you don't have to worry about messing anything up with respect to that. It'll be a one-to-one -one correspondence. It'll be fine. Likewise, each observed variable has a variance going in. And as long as each variable gets either a variance estimated for it or a residual variance, meaning leftover after being predicted, then you will be fine. So there's a one-to-one -one data going in, parameters coming out relationship here. We don't have to worry about either of these being a source of misfit, so long as we let each variable have its own intercept and its own residual variance. What they get labeled as differs as a function of whether they are truly an outcome or whether they are being a pretend outcome brought into the likelihood so that you can have missing data. So then we get to the place where there's potential for our model to be wrong. Whether or not we have adequately recreated the observed variable relationships that are described by a covariance matrix. So between each pair of variables, there's an observed covariance and we can choose whether we want to represent that relationship as what's known as a path. So those are the things with the arrows. Those are slopes. So paths, slopes, and direct effects, all of those words mean the exact same thing in this context. For whatever reason, we don't use the word slope in a path model. We say path. So a regression path is a slope that's describing the prediction of y from x. So I can let it be a directed relationship that's a slope, or I can just let it be a residual covariance. So that's like in the R matrix that we built, we can just let outcomes be related. And more specifically, we would be letting the residuals of the outcomes be related. So that's an agnostic statement as to which came first. We're just saying these two things are related to each other. And likewise, Every possible covariance between predictors with outcomes, we can choose to have slopes to describe those or residual covariances. So if we don't put in a specific relationship, either a path or a covariance, between a pair of variables, then we have the potential to be wrong. Because if we don't do that, we're assuming that there is no remaining relationship between those two variables that's not already taken, to, taken care of by the model. So that's where a potential misfit comes from. So three scenarios then with respect to degrees of freedom. Under-identified means game over. You will know if your model is under-identified because you will get output that says something like model is under-identified, standard errors could not be computed, and you'll get a column of estimates and no standard errors and no test statistics and no p-values. That means it's like, eh? I don't know. Here's my best guess at, at the last iteration, but I don't know what these things are. So under-identified is when you are trying to estimate more parameters than you have pieces of data to estimate them with. So you'd have to do something that's pretty crazy to stumble into this situation in path models. It's, it's relatively easy to end up with this by accident in latent variable models, but for path models, the only way that I can think of that this would happen is if you tried to describe one covariance with two different relationships. So if you tried to put 
like between two boxes, if you tried to put both a directed arrow and a covariance, then that's redundant because you'd have two parameters trying to account for one pairwise relationship and the model won't know how to do that. So generally speaking, you don't have to worry about this unless you do something um, ill-advised, let's put it that way. Just identified, I argue, for path models is probably where you want to be most of the time. And now this is somewhat of a controversial statement because some people think that you don't have, like then your theory is not strong enough if you can't remove some relationships, but I would rather not be wrong. So I would rather put in all the possible relationships and then maybe you can see what's not significant and could be removed. But the problem is that if you omit something that should be there, then all the rest of the relationships have to rearrange themselves to handle that omission. So if your model doesn't fit well, it's not trustworthy with respect to the relationships that are included. If you make it just identified, then you can't be wrong. And that's comforting. Just identified means that you've spent all possible parameters. So there are, there are as many paths and covariances are there, as there are covariances to be had. There are as many intercepts as there are variable means to be had. And there are as many residual variances as there are variable variances to be had. And so if you are in a just identified situation, model fit is not relevant because it fits perfectly. And this is one point that I've had to answer questions during a review process about. Like, why didn't you report fit? It's not relevant. Think of it this way. Have you ever talked about whether a model is just identified if you fit a regression model? Like back in general linear model land or anything we did this semester, you didn't hear the word just identified come out of my face at any point. Do you know why? All regression models are just identified. All of them. Because the predictors are not in the likelihood. The only thing that's in the likelihood is an outcome. And that outcome has an intercept. And that outcome has a residual variance. That makes it just identified. So we don't worry about this most of the time. This is a, a unique situation in which we're trying to describe relationships among a lot of variables at the same time. Just identified means we have described the relationships that exist in the data. Whether those relationships are useful or significant or have a reasonable effect size is a whole separate situation. So I have a slide on this later, but I'll make this point now. Just because your path model fits or fits perfectly does not mean that it is a good model. Over-identified means that we left something out. Over-identified means we have degrees of freedom to spare. We have not estimated all possible parameters. What that's going to mean in practice is that there are pairs of variables that do not have some kind of direct relationship between them. So the model then has to fill in that relationship with the parameters that are there and see if that is enough. If a model is over-identified, then the fit is testable and you do have to worry about the implications of leaving out what you left out in terms of the pairs of variables and their relationships. So here, then we talked about these situations, over-identified is the top. In both of these cases, there is a relationship directly between X1 and Y2 that is not included. So this has one degree of freedom. The middle scenario is just identified. There are no degrees of freedom left because every pair of variables has some kind of relationship, either a covariance or a directed slope. And under-identified would be something like this. Now there's people yelling outside. <laughs> okay. It's getting crazy up in here. I don't know what's going on today. So we did, we did this one, and yeah, math don't care. These, fit, these two right here fit the same, and all three of these things fit the same because they all fit perfectly, and this thing ain't solvable all by itself. Uh, now we get into algebra. Good times. Questions before we get into algebra? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to level with you guys. Do you know that expression? I'm going to be straight with you. Spill the tea. Can I say that? Sure, why not? I get into trouble when I try not to talk like an old person, so maybe I'll just stick with my usual uh, expressions. So there are all these rules of describing how 
a path model predicts the relationship between each pair of variables, even if there's not a direct relationship there. And I wrote all these down. It does look like pizza. I'll give you that. I wrote all these down, and I have this example, but I will tell you in practice, I do not do this. I have, I have an approach to fitting path models and realizing what is uh, correct and, and not correct in the same way that I approach grammar. Like, I could tell you a comma doesn't go there or a comma is needed there. I don't know why. Like, I don't know the rules behind it, but I know, like, intuitively what should happen. And so when I look at something like this, it doesn't jump out at me like how the model predicts things, but I can anticipate based on my knowledge of what these things each say, what, how the model could possibly be wrong. So if we just look at this for a second, like A to D right here, there's a direct relationship there. That one can't be wrong. This one can't be wrong. This one can't be wrong. This one can't be wrong. And this one can't be wrong. But there's a whole lot of direct relationships with F that are not in this picture. So C does not go directly to F, D does not go directly to F, B does not go directly to F, and A doesn't go directly to F. So that means that all of those relationships have to somehow be captured by the paths that are going up to that point. In practice, any software package, including R, will generate for you a matrix of model implied relationships from your path model and it will compare it to the original covariance matrix, and it will print a residual matrix for where your predictions are off. And that idea of residual matrix then can guide you towards a model that fits better and better captures the relationships among them. So it's not necessary in practice that you memorize these rules and that you work through the algebra yourself. The software will help you with that but I feel like I would be doing a bad job if I didn't at least present them to you. So, so here are the rules here. Total relations between variables can result from more than one path. You can't go through the same variable twice. You can't go forward then backward. And you can only go through one covariance and not two. So for instance, if I were to describe how does this model predict the relationship between variable B and variable D. So they're right here. There's actually two ways. The obvious one is right here. There is directly a relationship between B and D, but there's also a relationship if I go from B over to A via its covariance and then back down to D. So what that means in concept is that this path labeled lowercase b right here is the unique relationship between B and D after controlling for D's relationship with A as well. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah, because this is regression. <laughs> it's regression with pictures, but it's still regression. So conceptually, that makes sense, that part of the relationship between B and D is not just this part, but also the part that's shared in common that it doesn't get, that it doesn't get credit for individually. So the full relationship between B and D is the B path that's direct, as well as this linkage going through A and then A down to D. Um, let's see, another one for C to D. Same idea. There is no direct path from C to D, but there is one if I go from C to B over here via one curved arrow and then down from B to D. I can't, however, go get to C to D by going this way and then backwards. You can't go backwards in these diagrams. And by the way, when you're drawing these pictures, universally people will draw them either moving from left to right with the arrows or top to bottom. Um, sometimes I'll do both. If I have a really crazy picture, I'll sort of start at the top left and work my way down to the bottom right. But it will confuse people if you start from the opposite direction. So. My guess is that that has to do with a convention of writing in English where all the words go left to right, and maybe there may be other conventions in languages that go right to left instead. But you can't go backwards, so you can't get from C to D by going down here and back here. Um, likewise, A to B, there's only one relationship here. We can't go down to D and then back to B this way. So no going backwards on these things. Uh, A to E, here's another one. So 
no direct relationship from A to E, but the model says that A and E are in fact related. They are related if we go from A to, A to D and then D to E, that's one path. But then we can also go over here and go from F to B to D, as well as from, let's see, where's H? Oh, H, all the way down here and then here. So this is why it gets tricky to figure out sometimes what the model is saying a relationship between two variables is. Even though there is nothing that's directly connecting A and E, they are connected. They are connected because of their relationships with other intermediate variables right here. So the model has a chance to be wrong anytime there's not a direct relationship that can sort of fill the gap that the other relationships leave. And all of these are specified in terms of correlations for convenience, but if you wanted to talk about covariances too, then you'd have to throw in the variances of these variables as part of your algebra here. So to get from B to D, for instance, it's the variance of B times this path plus this covariance and that path would get us to the covariance of these things rather than the correlation. Okay. And A to F is even more complicated, as you can see. But. So big picture. Amongst the pieces slice. We're at the, we're at the point of the semester where I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to make you hunt for the purpose. Big picture. If a pair of variables does not have a direct relationship, that can be wrong. If it does have a direct relationship, then you are good. Because that direct relationship will plug in the hole for whatever is missing with respect to how those variables are actually related. So the term for this, one might call variable D and E, these intermediate things, we might call those mediators. And it's often of interest to what extent relationships are still present after controlling for the relationships that go through the mediators. So I have a couple examples on that that we'll do probably next week about that. So questions on this so far? Model predicted covariances then. I have a, a shorter example where we can do a little more with the algebra. So this picture here, x1 and x2 are predictors, but I have drawn their variances here with this two-headed arrow thing to convey the idea that I have brought them into the likelihood. So we talked about this last time, a lot of confusing vocabulary. If a predictor is in the likelihood which is what happens by default in status SEM package as well as PROC Kalis and SAS when you invoke full information maximum likelihood. It brings all the predictors into the likelihood. Then its means, variances, and its covariances with other predictors become model parameters. They have to be estimated or the model will not be correct. You can then have missing data on these predictors because they are in the likelihood. But the trade-off is that then you are making distributional assumptions about them. So if you want to have missing data, you have to be willing to pretend like they're outcomes. That means we're assuming that they're multivariate normal. And in this picture, it is not their conditional distributions that we're talking about. Because they're not being predicted by anything. It's their marginal distributions that we're assuming is multivariate normal. So like if you made a histogram of the variable, that thing should look like it's normal. That's not the same as for Y1 and Y2, because these are truly outcomes of these X1 and X2 predictors, then these two variables we're assuming are conditionally normal. The residuals are normal. So it's a more stringent assumption for the predictors that are brought into the likelihood to pretend like they're outcomes. But I'm doing this to make, to make the math a little bit easier with respect to all of these predictions. So then this picture corresponds to these linear equations with the exception that I do not have anything in the picture to denote the intercepts because that's where the stupid triangle will come in and I didn't have room for that on this slide. So x1 then is essentially being fit with an empty model. It has an estimated intercept which if there's no predictors that's just its mean and it has a residual for how far off it is from the mean and the variance of those residuals is its variance. 
So the same is true for x1 and x2. It's as if we fit an empty model, so we get back the mean for it, we get back its total variance because it's not being predicted by anything. Unconditional. Y1 then has an intercept, which we would interpret the usual way. It's the predicted outcome when all the predictors are zero. So that means centering is also relevant in this context, although people often forget that. It has a relationship for x1, and it has a relationship for x2, and it has a residual. And then y2 only has a direct relationship with y1. So in the syntax of all of these programs, what you are going to write is going to look a lot like what's on the right-hand side here. You would end up writing out essentially the system of equations that corresponds to your picture. And for that reason, there are some packages, like Amos was one of the first ones to do this, that allows you to draw the picture, and it writes the code that's corresponding to the picture. Now, this is both good and bad, potentially. Because, you know, my son can draw a path model picture. Does that make it an estimable, reasonable model? Maybe not. So there was actually a thing in M plus for many, many years when M plus was first created, their creators, the mutanes, said there was never going to be a diagrammer because they felt like that was just an opportunity for people to do stupid shit with data and they didn't want to have any part of it. And lo and behold, their head programmer, uh, Asparov is his last name, his 13-year-old son for a class project made the M plus diagrammer. I know, in case we didn't feel inadequate already, right? There's this genius 13-year-old who programmed the M plus diagram. And the mutanes were so impressed that they didn't have the heart to say no, and it's in M plus now. So when you run M plus, there's an option to have it make a diagram for you or not. And, it, and his algorithm draws the picture that your code generated. Now, I will tell you, if you go that way, if you write out the equations and ask it to make a picture, the pictures are sometimes really ugly. Like they just look like crazy, like spider web nets of paths everywhere because the algorithm can't always anticipate what you meant. So I tend not to use the pictures that are generated by these, these packages. I tend to make my own. But in practice, if I have anything that's more complicated than this, I will draw out a picture like on a napkin and then I'll write the code from my picture. So it really does help, I think, to organize what predicts what and what came first and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, and then here are the other ways that you will see residual variances dictated. This is like a more of an SEM kind of way. It will put a circle for the residual and say that it has a path with a weight of 1. And that means that this variable has an estimated residual variance. And so technically speaking, then, if we were going to put a covariance in, it would have to be between these E's instead of the variables here. But these two are predicting each other directly, not their residuals. Um, oh, yeah, that's one thing that I, I find confusing that I want to make a point of. So if we look at this relationship for y1 here, it's the original y1 that is predicting y2. It's not the y1 part that's left over after being predicted by x1 and x2. So it's not the residual of y that's predicting y2. It's the original variable. Okay, how are we doing so far? Reasonably well? Okay. So this model then has six covariances that are possible because I've got four variables here. Four of them are going to be perfectly recreated because there's direct paths between those pairs. So first off, we have the, the, the relationship between x1 and x2. Because these are predictors that are brought into the likelihood, that covariance counts as part of model fit, and it will be perfect. So this is just allowing it to be there, and it will take on whatever value would be estimated directly from the data. Potentially a different value if you have missing data, though, because it's going to try to recreate what the covariance would be if the data were complete instead, under an assumption of missing at random. Likewise, x1 and y1, that one's perfect, because I've got a direct path here that's going to fill in whatever gap. So part of the relationship between x1 and y1 is because of this path here, but the other part of it is going through the covariance and then down to the other side. x2 and y1, 
perfect for the same reason. Y1 and Y2, perfect for the same reason. The model implied variances of Y1 and Y2 are complicated, but they will also be perfectly recreated because there's this residual variance that will just pick up whatever's left. So we know what the original variance of Y1 and Y2 should be based on the data. And so after the paths have their say, then the residual variances just plug the gap and they become whatever's left. So those things are functions of the paths coming from X1 and its variance the paths coming from x2 squared and its variance, the covariance between the two and then the residual variance. The one for y2 is even uglier, but it's essentially the squared paths times the variance of each, keeping track of the covariance, and all of those things are cool. Now where this can be wrong, the relationship between x1 and y2 and the relationship between x2 and y2. This model overlooks those two relationships, so it would have two degrees of freedom, because we could have put them in and we didn't. So the model says that the covariance between x1 and x2 is based on what is there, which is this path and going around to get that way, and vice versa for the other one, but we have the chance to be wrong. Okay. Algebra! No. Yeah, no. Again, big picture. How do I know if I could be wrong? This is, this is an audience question. Audience participation question. How do I know if I could be wrong? If it's not direct, yeah. I could be wrong for any relationship that does not have a direct something connecting the two variables. So if your model don't fit, this is where you look. Now how do you know if your model don't fit? Well, there's about 18 ways that you can find that out. So I am going to hit this relatively briefly because in path models it's not going to be that much of an issue. We will get to hear this again in more detail in the structural equation modeling class if you come back this fall. So we have the output for our model is referred to in the uh, M plus output files as well as in Levon as the HO model. The HO model is yours. The other one that it will give you is something that's called H1. H1 is the data. H1 is unstructured or saturated. You can use either word in this context. H1 is what would the log likelihood be if we just estimated all the means, we estimated all the variances, and we just let all the variables co-vary. Screw it. There's no slopes. There's no story here. We just let it be. What would the log likelihood be? That's as tall as your data, your model can possibly be for this data set. That's your, that's your baseline with respect to the best you can do. So one of the pieces of information that we will get is a likelihood ratio test of H1 versus HO, meaning Relative to the best you can do, how much worse is your model? If your model is just identified, the log likelihoods will match because your model is just a rearrangement of the data. If you have all possible pairwise relationships, it will fit the same. So this is only a question assuming that you have an over-identified model, meaning you've overlooked certain direct relationships, you have degrees of freedom that you have yet spent. So can I tell you a story about HO and H1? This is a true story. All of my stories are true, actually. I, I try not to lie. But for a long time, when I was first teaching this stuff, I used to get confused as to which was HO and H1 because it's like not obvious based on the labels, like what it should be. And then something happened that caused me to forever be unconfused. So I want to share this story with you so you can be for, forever unconfused as well. I was in office hours, which this was at Nebraska pre-pandemic, which was held in a computer lab. So like, you know, 15 people would show up and I'd walk around the room helping people with their homework and they'd all, you know, sit there and work on stuff. And I had two different classes I was helping as usual. And someone, her, her name was Lindsay, raised her head up and said, am I the hoe? And I was like, what? 
like the apropos of nothing. Am I the hoe? What? N M plus. Am I the hoe? Oh, do you mean is your model the H O model and not the H one model? Then yes, yes, Lindsay, you are the hoe. And like from that point forward, I never forgot it. So just write this down. You are the hoe. You are not the H one. So H0, as in like null hypothesis, is sort of where this comes from, I think, but it doesn't actually make any sense because you'd think the null would be the H1 model and that's why I got confused. But you are all the hoes. Your model is the HO model. <laughs> okay? <laughs> yes, and, and, and Lindsay went on to graduate not just with a PhD but also with JD. She did the dual degree program, so she is a lawyer and a PhD social psychologist who specializes in law psych kinds of stuff. So she is the hoe, but she is also very accomplished, as all we are all. So anywho, you will get, as part of your output, a likelihood ratio test that tells you how much worse your HO model is than the best possible model. That means that Relative to what you're used to seeing for the result of a likelihood ratio test, we want this test to be non-significant. So it's backwards. Because what we're testing is whether or not the covariance matrix that our model recreates with all our paths fits as well as the original covariance matrix fits. So if we have a significant difference between these models, and one of them is perfect, that means our model is significantly worse than perfect. We don't want that. So again, if you're just identified, if you put in direct relationships between every pair of variables, you don't have to worry about this. This is only if you've overlooked things. So some of the fit indices that we get are based on a comparison against this H1 perfect saturated model, the best it can be. And some of them are relative to the worst that it can be instead. So you will see another likelihood ratio test, which is useless in most cases, describing the difference between the saturated model as the best possible, as well as a comparison which is the worst possible. So this is called either an independence model, a null model, or sometimes a baseline model, even though that's a terribly unhelpful phrase. In this alternative, every variable gets a mean and a variance, but all the covariances are forced to zero. So some of the fit statistics then are relative to the worst you could do, how much better is yours? So some are, how much worse than perfect are you? And others are, how much better than the worst are you? So you can end up with a situation where some fit indices say, you're great, and others say, no, because they're relative to different benchmarks here. The only situation in which the likelihood ratio test comparing the independence worst model to the best saturated model would be useful is to test whether or not you have any business modeling these data at all. <laughs> so let's think about this. If the model where all the covariances get to be whatever they want does not fit better than the model where all the covariances are forced to be zero, what does that mean? It means practically speaking, they're zero. And if you have a whole bunch of variables that are not related to each other at all, then what are you doing? Like game over, right? So that's a situation in which there would be no point in, in proceeding because there are no relationships for your model to capture, but that's gonna be very rare in practice. So global fit is the first thing we worry about. Then we worry about something called local fit, check out the results, make sure they make sense, and then we look at the strength of the paths. So in terms of global fit, we get this chi-square, which is a likelihood ratio test of your HO model against the perfect one. And if you have a lot of people, this likelihood ratio test chi-square is going to be significant because you will have a lot of power. If you have a lot of people, to detect discrepancies between what the data say your covariance matrix should look like and what your model says it should look like. So it is very rarely the case in practice that you will get an actually non-significant chi-square. Most of the time it will be significant and people just ignore it. Instead, they go with other fit indices that describe either how much worse than perfect you are or how much better than the worst you are. 
So here's a few of those. Uh, standardized root mean square residual, SRMR, as it what it goes by. This is how far off each correlation is, is what it boils down to. So you can say on your overall matrix as a whole, what is the discrepancy between what the model says a correlation should be between two variables and what the data say? Add all that up and figure out what the average offness of those correlations are per correlation, and that's SRMR. And conventions say less than 0.08 or so is good fit. There's also an unstandardized version of this. Uh, by the way, in terms of what is good being high or low, if your fit statistic has the word error or residual in it, you want it to be as small as possible. If your fit statistic has the word fit in it, you want it to be as big as possible. So there's a mnemonic that you can use to keep those straight. Here's another one that is very commonly reported. RMSEA, root mean square error of approximation. This one is how far off your model is per element divided by the degrees of freedom that you have left over. So this one penalizes for models that have a lot of extra paths to it that aren't really doing anything. It has a lot of conventions as to what is good enough. It also has a confidence interval that is reported in software so that you can get a sense of how variable that estimate potentially is. And there's also a test of close fit that's provided sometimes against an RMSEA less than 0.05. So this is another one where we want smaller is better. Uh, comparative fit index and the Tucker-Lewis, aka non-normed fit index, these are both indices of fit. These are relative to the worst model, how much better is yours? So you want these to be as high as possible, preferably greater than 0.95. Uh, the bottom one here is non-normed, so it actually can go out of bounds with respect to the range of 0 to 1. Don't worry about that. And, yeah, so we look at, we'll get this list of all these fit indices, and we have to worry about whether or not they're telling us if our model is sufficiently good. One caveat, though something I don't have time to go into in great detail here, but I will in SEM a little bit more. All of these rules as to what good is, like 0.95 is good enough or 0.08 is good enough, they come from one simulation study that's 22 years old and has been cited when I made this slide two years ago, 68,000 times. So it's probably more since then. And more recently, people have figured out that, huh, maybe one simulation study can't possibly be the answer for every situation. So for example, they were looking in a structural equation modeling context where they had factor loadings describing the relationship between an observed item response and a latent factor. And the reliability was relatively high in those cases. They had a relatively small model of only 15 variables and three factors, and they had generated complete data. So it turns out that if you vary any of these three ideas, if you make the relationship of the items to their factors smaller, or if you make the, the model bigger by having more variables in it, or if you have missing data, then what is good changes. So I think it's less the case nowadays that there is a universal standard for what is acceptable. And I think the expectation is that you would want to consider your particular situation and see if there's any caveats that you need to introduce because of the considerations in your unique data set. So these are, these are heuristics. They're not like hard and fast rules, particularly for non-normal outcomes. Okay, 123. We're doing good. Now, we'll go back here. So what if this stuff is broken? What if we have a significant result, fit indices are not good? We have to figure out why. Intuitively, the only way that we can fix a misfitting model is to figure out where the hole is in what's being predicted and plug that hole with another parameter. So we would want to pay attention to the pairs of relationships that do not have direct paths between them because that's where the problems are going to be. So the idea of going into the matrix of covariances and trying to figure out exactly where the holes are, 
relative to what's been predicted and what's been mispredicted, that's what's known as local misfit, or trying to find localized model strength. So think of it this way. Let's say that you have a kid who brought home a report card where they have a B average, 3.0 on a 4.0 scale. B average is not so bad, particularly if, if that's their best effort. But if you wanted to try to help them get their grades up, just knowing that overall across all their classes they have a B average is not going to be enough information for you to help them get up to an A. Because it's a very different prescription if they have like B's in all their classes than if they have like three A's and one F. Because three A's and one F would also equal out to a B average. And if I were the parent, I'd want to know, well, what's the F in? Is it in like something that matters, like math? Or is it like, you know, gym class and they didn't want to play kickball? I'd let them have the F if they didn't want to play kickball or dodgeball, God forbid. Do people still play dodgeball? Is that a thing? I remember just like little boys just throwing balls at me as hard as they possibly could. And that was somehow like a school activity. Turns out, though, I was really good at dodgeball because I was small. <laughs> so I just, you know, dodged or I caught it because they didn't expect me to catch it. So I, I was all right at dodgeball. But if he wants to fail dodgeball, I'm totally fine with that. So point being, if, if something looks sort of not great on the whole, our job is to go in and figure out why it's not great and fix the problem. So you can get output that tells you essentially where the problems are, and then you can work to fix it. So I'll do that in the example that we have. So this is the process that we would go through. Make sure that we have, if it's not just identified, that we haven't missed anything, that all of the direct relationships that we've omitted should actually be zero or close to it. But then we have to consider what this actually means. So here's an example path model. I would say that I get this question over email at least once a semester by random people who find my website and try to teach themselves whatever my website is covering, I get this question at least once. And the question goes something like this. I have a path model and it fits really, really, really well, but none of my paths are significant. How can that be? That can totally be. Because what does fit mean in this context is not the same thing as effect size. What fit means is that the arrows that you have placed in your model to relate each pair of vari variables, that you have captured what relationships are there. So you can have a good fitting model that captures a bunch of shitty relationships. That can totally happen. So if these variables are not related to each other in the first place, you put your paths in to capture those non-relationships and it will fit well. But it doesn't mean that there's relationships worth producing, reproducing. So there's a difference between model fit, which is a preliminary prerequisite to being able to look at your results, and what do the results say with respect to the strength of your prediction. So the size of the effects, as well as the R-square for each of these outcome variables, those things are a separate consideration. Effect size still matters. And you will get R-squares for each outcome variable as part of your output so that you can report such things, in addition to all of these unique slopes describing pairs of relationships and covariances and so forth. All right. How are we doing? Want to see an example? Why not? We did get to the example today. I'm proud of myself. That means I didn't ramble too far. I have pulled up part two of example 5A. That's what I have here. So this was a handout originally posted a couple weeks ago. I can tell you where it was originally posted. Hang on. Find. Uh, this class. Example 5A was originally posted on 414, and I just updated the Stata code to it yesterday when I was making your homework because, yet again, 
There were pieces of information I asked about in the homework that I realized data did not provide directly, so I had to go into the documentation and figure out how to ask for it. But I did. So I've got, I've got that addition added here. So this is part two of the family data example that we did before. I am on page 15 of 26. So do you remember the story for these data? Maybe a little bit? Uh, predicting conservative marital attitudes in three people from the same family. We had the kid, the adult child, the mom, and the dad. I was predicting it from the gender of the adult child as well as the education level of each person. And then I had added dad's education as an additional predictor for the attitudes of the kid and the mom. And that was where the original example ended. That was the last model back when I originally uh, made this. And then I decided, oh, I can take these data and use it to demonstrate path models too. And I realized that my original example didn't actually fit that well. So now it's an example of how to troubleshoot a misfitting model. So I have code in here in Stata. I have code in here in M+, which is a new package that we haven't seen yet. And I have code in here in Levon, which is very close to what the M plus code is because Levon was written to be like a free version of M plus. So we have some stuff that you haven't seen before and some stuff that you have. The first step though that I have here in SAS code is to create a data set to be used in M plus. So M plus is a standalone package and they have invested all of their resources in trying to come up with cutting edge statistical modeling and none of their resources in data input or output. So to use M+, you have to provide it with a text file of data, either in a .dat extension or my preferred version, CSV, for comma-separated values. So I am taking the wide format data where these are the names of my columns, and to make an M+, file, I am first removing all of the missing data and putting in a missing data code instead. This is not strictly necessary, but it's somewhat superstitious behavior on my part because whenever I don't do this, it seems like M plus does not read the data correctly. So I'm in the habit of using missing data codes whenever I export data for use in M plus. I'm then using proc, proc export to create a comma separated values tab. And so then this is the data that M plus will be using in this example. Um, in Stata, I figured out how to make an M plus file out of Stata if you wanted to. They have this nice easy thing here, MVN code, which replaces all of the missing values with whatever number you put in parentheses here. And then I'm using an export command to create the M plus file as in CSV format without variable names because that's the other piece of it. The top row is not variable names in M plus. And here's what I would do to make that same file using R. So regardless of where your native package is, you can make an M plus data set. Um, I would highly encourage you, by the way, to do whatever data manipulation steps you need to do in whatever package your data are stored in, SAS, SPSS, R, what, what have you, because M plus kind of sucks for data manipulation. It has some built-in features to try to make it easier, but the order of operations in which they're applied can be not what you want. So I tend not to do any data transformations in M plus. So here is the model that we left off with in part one of this example. I have, let's see here. Uh, and I remember now my, not my notational system, by the way. The last time I stared at this, I was like, what did I do here? I remembered. <laughs> Kaylin, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I know. That, that was not a proud moment for me. But sometimes my brain just like short circuits and I'm like, I know I did this. I have no idea what it means. But I'm, it's back. It's back though, I remember now. So the second subscript is who are we talking about? The second subscript is zero for dad, one for kid, and two for mom. The first subscript is which predictor are we talking about? So the, the intercepts all start with zero because that's usually what a fixed intercept is, it starts at zero. Then the first predictor that I examined was the gender of the adult child. The second predictor I examined was dad's education. The third predictor was the kid's education. Fourth was mom's education. And so that's why the subscripts are the way that they are.
I knew I had a reason for it. I just couldn't come up with it that day. But I've had enough Mountain Dew to get the cylinders firing once again. And Chipotle for lunch. Yes, I know it's Chipotle, but that's what my mom calls it. Chipotle or Chipotle. So we've just sort of started calling it that. Close enough, right? This new box, this is what I added yesterday for Stata users. Stata's output for path models does not give you the H1 log likelihood, and it does not tell you how many parameters were estimated. And both of those are questions on your last homework, so I went and tracked down how you would get that information out of saved Stata result, and these are the two lines that you would add to do that. So much like um, having Stata compute minus two log likelihood for you, or other things that are like in it that you just have to ask for, add these two lines. And in the online files that go with this example, I did add those two lines, so they're in there for you. All right, Stata people, SEM is your package. GSEM is a different package, we'll do that one later, I think. Okay, so now I gotta remember how all this stuff works. Constant, that is the fixed intercept. So the first line here, note that all of this is one line according to Stata because there's line continuers on everything. All of this is one command. I have it on separate lines to make it easier to read. But underscore constant predicting these things, that refers to their fixed intercepts. Regressions are identified with arrows, and you can go either way in this code. So I have the kids' education and the kids' gender as predictors of the kids' outcome right here. So the way that I'm writing this is Y is predicted by the predictors, and that way it's in the same order as a typical equation for a linear model. Here's mom predicting the mom's outcome. Dad's education predicting all three. I want residual variances for all three of my outcomes, and note that they're residual variances because they have this E dot thing in front of them. So like E for residual. There we go. I'm asking for residual covariances between all pairs of the three outcomes. So this much of the code right here is analogous to estimating an unstructured R matrix in the mixed packages. Because I'm letting each outcome have a separately estimated residual variance and I'm estimating all three separate residual covariances among my outcomes. MLMV is how you tell it use full information maximum likelihood, even though these data don't have any incomplete to them. Um, that's generally what I would pick. LINCOM shows up in path models as well to do linear combinations. So I'm asking for the difference in the slopes of dad's education predicting each person's outcome. And you might ask yourself, how in the hell did you know what they were called? Because if you look at this, this does not look like a Lisa label, does it? Like if I had my druthers, this is not how I would do it. I learned what the hell they were called by adding this piece right here. COEF legend is it adds a piece of output that tells you what Stata is calling each of your parameters so that you'll know how to refer to them. So you have to use its labeling system. That is not true in the other packages. So then I figured out that the slopes that I was interested in were underscore B and then the outcome being predicted, colon, the name of the predictor. I also want a standardized solution. So this gives me the standardized slopes and uh, R square values. I think maybe that's, that's a separate command. In other packages, they go together. Goodness of fit, all of it. R square per variable. I also want um, the matrix of residuals for the covariances. So basically the local fit as to how far off the actual covariances in the data are from the ones predicted by the paths in the model. And then this very last piece here is asking for suggestions as to how to improve fit. These are formerly known as modification indices. You will see that I refer to them as voodoo. 
because these are just mathematical ideas that will solve your fit problems. There's no guarantee they make any kind of sense whatsoever. All right, 139, closing in on the end of class. Stata users, stare at this code with me. Any questions on it so far? Not yet. Okay, here's all the output. So all three of these programs, by the way, are going to give you a log likelihood not minus two log likelihood. So in log likelihood, is bigger better or is smaller better? Smaller is better. Which oh, one's no. better? No. Right. Is bigger better or smaller better if it's log smaller. likelihood? Smaller. That's minus two log likelihood. It's oh. bigger. Yeah, it's bigger better. This is how tall the data are given the model. So this is the one for the HO model, specifically. It does not match the other packages because of the way that the predictors are being handled. They've been brought into the likelihood in Stata against my will, whereas they are not in the other packages. But the results all match. So what I have here then, on the right-hand side of the page, this took me a long time, so that's why I'm pointing it out. I'm trying to get some credit for my efforts here. I labeled the corresponding fixed effect and or variance model element from the mixed output and where it shows up on, on the SEM output here. So your fixed slopes, for instance, this is kid marital being predicted. Here are the four things that are predicting it. One of them is an intercept and then three slopes for the predictors. Here's the model predicting mother's attitudes from the intercept and two predictors. And here's the model predicting dad's attitudes from just the intercept and one predictor. So this part of it is very much the same as looking at any linear model output. It's just that now I have essentially three linear models happening at the same time. So the first column is the coefficient for the slope. The second column is the standard error for the slope. Coefficient divided by standard error is treated as a Z without denominator degrees of freedom. And there's the corresponding p-value, and then it gives you a confidence interval for the slopes as well. And then down here are the variances and covariances of the residuals for each outcome. And this right here, likelihood ratio test of model versus saturated is a chi-square with six degrees of freedom. That means there's six paths I could have put in that I didn't. I'm missing six things. And it looks like the model is borderline significant. Meaning on the whole it's fine, but it could, it could be better. Here are the differences in the slopes that I had computed before. Here's the table that tells me what all the parameters were called. Here's my standardized solution. So this is assuming all the variables are z-scored into mean zero standard deviation one. These are residual correlations instead as labeled and then here's the rest of the fit statistics. So according to this, our model is eh. RMSEA is under 0.08, but just barely. Uh, CFI is 0.87, that's not good enough. It needs to be above 0 0.9, 0 0.95. SRMR is okay though. So some of these think the model's okay, some of them don't. That means we probably have more work to do. And then here are the R squares for the three, the three variables as well. Okay. So, so far, this is just like your typical linear model regression output, but on steroids, because there's more than one linear model being happening at the same time. And that's a good place for us to start. Stop. Not start. I got to start the next class at this place. Next fall, those of you who are going to take both my classes, we're going to party all afternoon long. You'll, you'll get to see what it's like. No, no one's like looking happy about that. Okay, it's too early to talk about next fall. I get it. I understand. All right, any questions before we wrap it up for the week? Since it is not garbage day. All right, then we will pick this up next week. Have good weekends. Do your formative assessment. Let me know if you need anything. Okay, thanks for being here.